Amen. Give me that notebook off my desk. If you don't mind. And a uh, bunch of places we're going to start. The first one will be in John, uh, John chapter 2, I believe. So get your Bible. I got, I got my stuff coming here in just a second. And uh, we'll open here this morning with uh, some passage of Scripture. And I'm going to actually uh, have you to turn to two or three different ones. And I don't always do that. Uh, so, so this morning I'll do maybe a little bit slower down than normal and get this truth in your heart. Um, John chapter number 12, John chapter number 12, and uh, we'll look here at this story that Jesus told, and then I'm going to read some scripture in Luke 14, so you'll want to be looking at that, John chapter 12, that's why you bring your Bible to church, uh, don't try this looking up on your phone to be cool, Get it, look, bring your Bible, because you can hold it in your lap and flip the pages, all right? John chapter number 12. Um, John 12, 1, 12, 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Now, look at verse 3. And Mary took a pound of ointment, of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Now, that word odor here in the Bible, I don't, we think of odor means something bad, but odor, the original meaning of the word odor is just a fragrance, a smell. So when they, when they broke, it'd be like perfume or cologne, and you open a, bo a bottle of it in here, put it around this room, that's what, it filled the whole house. Now, John, uh, Luke 14. I'll get back to that scripture in just a second. Luke 14, 23. Luke chapter 14, verse 23. And I do want you to hold your Bibles there because I'm going to have you turn to about two more verses here in just a minute. If it's the Lord's will. Luke chapter number 14. And you'll look here at verse number 23. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. What a thought. What a thought. He said, look, we're going to have this big supper. We're going to have a wedding. And we want it full of people. We want everybody to come to this wedding. Everybody come to this supper. And you go out there and compel people to come in here that my house could be filled. You man going to have a, a wedding for his son or going to have a supper and he wants it full. Every restaurant wants a full, uh, every seat filled. Every concert that the world puts on, they want all the seats filled, obviously. Every church that's got a brain in their head wants the church house filled. And the Lord said that. And I want to preach on that this morning. What did the Lord mean when he said that my house may be filled? that my house may be filled. This is a long time often quoted by preachers and Sunday school teachers to encourage church attendance. But that's not all that the Lord meant. I want to just drive that one nail home hard this morning just for a few minutes, then we'll sing some more here in a minute, uh, and just say, uh, uh, you, our, our job is to see the Lord's house Field. Now, that don't mean just people. Normally, when you hear a preacher preach on that, or you hear, well, let's go out and get them that the house of God may be filled. Now, there's a couple things. First of all, this, this technical, uh, physical building here in the Bible is not the house of God, uh, necessarily. Uh, the house of God is the people gathering together. There, there, is, there is no such thing that in this dispensation, that's a building built, that's a house of God. Now, I know we, it's set apart. I get that. It's sanctified. When we go by and say, there's a church, I know what we mean. We say that there's a church building, but the church is the people that meet in that building. We could all, we could all meet down there on the side of, uh, uh, side of the, the river next Sunday morning and have a guitar and Bible and pray and preach and sing, and that would be the gathering of the church. But this, there's always, always been in the Bible a place 
where the Lord met with his people, even in the Old Testament, and that sanctuary and that tabernacle and all that, that's a principle that God has always had a certain place for people to meet and worship him. It sure, they sure have. I mean, that's undeniable. And so, um, uh, you, have to, uh, you have preachers preach it all different kind of ways. One gets up and he says, uh, well, we're two or three are gathered together, there I'm missing. And that is very true. That is true. That's no excuse not to try to get more. And then you have other preachers that say, if you preach the truth as hard as I do, you ain't going to have a big crowd. And that's a little bit true too. Uh, but that's no excuse not to get others to fill God's house. So when the Lord said that my house may be filled, it wasn't just people. See, what good's it going to do to fill this place up full of people if that's all you got? That's what I'm going to hit at this morning. And I just read to you in John where the Bible said that woman cooked in there that ointment and she poured it out there and the house was filled with the odor of that ointment. My first point would be our houses, that God's house, this church building, should be filled with prayer. Should be filled with prayer. If you know anything about the Bible, the odor of the ointment represents prayer. The incense going up in the Old Testament. That represented prayer. So when we pray, it's like, it's like uh, somebody burning incense and that odor goes up like this. When we all prayed in here a while ago, those prayers just went up. And God heard and will answer those prayers. So he wants his house to be filled with prayer. Amen? It's a picture of it. The prayers of God's people can fill. If you, if you uh, came in here uh, this morning and you opened a bottle of real expensive perfume. Ladies, cologne, men, right? And uh, yeah, now you got to be careful buying them things. Cause they'll have a they'll have a bottle that's really about this tall, and but man that that glass is that thick and it twists around. Remember they ain't a half ounce in there, and you'll be paying you'll be paying seventy five dollars for a for a, a two squirts of perfume. Very costly. That's what the Bible says about that. Uh, now I can help you that. But you won't listen, uh, but uh, you know there are places you can get it uh, where you got a lot more bottle, less bottle, and a little more perfume. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm going to Belks and I'm going to buy the Dillard's and I'm going to buy. Well, you know, uh, I don't know. About, I don't know. I, don't, I can help you, but you won't listen. Uh, but anyway, I'm going in there and I'm going to pay a hundred dollars. Uh, I have them one day, one day, and I come by one of these. One of these girls said, "Oh, you smell good, brother Danny." They, they thought I'd bought that, that for ninety dollars. It was, it was uh, thirteen ninety nine at TJ Maxx, and uh, lasts you forever. And uh, you know, uh, if you took a bottle of that, very costly. I have no idea what the most expensive perfume is right now. Some uh, some Victoria's Secret or Paris Hilton or something. I don't I have no idea. I know my wife likes certain ones, but. If, let's just say, let's just say you went to Charlotte and you bought the most expensive perfume that you could buy. And you brought it in here and you just broke the bottle and throwed it down the floor. It wouldn't be but a few minutes till the odor would fill this room. So when somebody walked in and say, my goodness, whew, some, that smell, it smells good in here. Good night. And the Bible said when that woman bought that, it was very costly. A lot of money. It was a price paid for that smell to be in there. And the Bible said it filled the house. I believe God wants his house to be filled with prayer. And I'm going to tell you something about praying, people. It is very costly. It'll cost you something. We're living in a time when people think you go to church on Sunday morning to see a show. And that, that, that's just, a, I mean, it's, it's okay. But boy, it sure is different. Uh, some of it's okay. And it sure is different from back in the old days when the saints of God had been praying all week long. And people got a hold of God and prayed. I'll never forget. You've heard me tell it. I used to preach in them little old mountain churches all up in Burnsville, Spruce Pine, Bakersville. I used to, all around up in there. That's some there's some good people up in them mountains, y'all. Always have been for years and years and years. And I'll never forget walking in there with a preacher. I was about 20, 21 years old. And I walked up there in my Bible one night. And them little bitty country churches, I used to preach at one called Rockdale. Rockdale Baptist. I guess it's still there. And the whole, they call it Rockdale because the whole church on a rock. The whole church building is not 
any bigger than this choir area, and it's sitting on solid rock. And uh, I'd go in them little churches, and 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 the, the trail go up that way, and a driveway would go up that way, and them people just come out of nowhere. Them men had them overalls on, and them old dear old ladies had to dress down to here. And there's an old woman come up and, with her Bible like this right here, and she's coming up the hill like this, and she said. I said, how you doing there, sister? She said, I've been down there in them woods praying all day today. And boy, when she said that, it was just like I thought, whoa, man, God's in this place. And it wasn't my imagination. Sometimes you could go in them old time, Bible preaching, churches, and it's like you, you know, like if you smelled an odor, it was like you could feel the presence of God by people's prayers. As a matter of fact, that's what got me saved. That night I went to church and I got saved. There was something different in the atmosphere in that place, y'all. And you remember, you remember when you really got right with God? Let your mind go back to that service where you really, really right with God. It wasn't just a preacher. It wasn't just a singer. It was just, there was somebody else in that room. It was God's power, uh, God's presence, and God, people praying. It sure was. Very costly. Very costly. I'll never forget, we had a youth rally one time. I had this several times. And I remember you know, when we'd have youth rally, uh, you, honest to goodness, it's not people's imagination. People could come in and they could say, my goodness, I can feel excitement in the air. I can feel, Lord, I, it ain't even service, ain't even started yet. And I felt, you know what that was? People being on their knees praying. People being on their, on their, their, uh, their belly fasting. And they've been praying that God would get in prayer. The Bible said that when that woman dropped that bottle of stuff and it filled the house, it was very costly. Now, I'm going to tell you this morning, if we are going to have the camp meeting that I believe the Lord would like for us to have, if we're going to see God's power continue to fall on our kids, if we're going to, somebody going to have to pray. Somebody. Somebody. There's no other way to do it. It's expensive. I've had people tell me, Brother Danny, why don't you, why don't you get this? You can get in, why don't you get this? And that might help a little bit, but it don't help if all you've got people and no prayer in the house. There's got to be. Somebody has to have the odor of the ointment fill the whole place with prayer. Somebody got to pay a big price. You've heard me tell it before. Miss, dear Mrs. Edwards, bless her heart, she's been going to heaven a long time now, fasted six days and nights for the revival that I got saved in. Y'all saw the kids when they come back from camp. Remember when we come back from camp and you have kids that didn't even want to go to church before we went to camp and after camp standing up here crying? And give them testimony. And boy, you know what that does? They can feel that's prayer. That's prayer. A water slide didn't do that to them. Amen. A basketball game didn't do that to them. Uh, playing volleyball in the gym didn't do that to them. Somebody, somebody, a bunch of us in here paid a high cost, brother. And we prayed. And the power and the prayers of God's people filled the house. He said that my house may be filled. God wants his house filled with prayer. What if every one of us went home this evening and uh, you quit doing whatever you're doing at 4, 4.30 or whatever and say, you know what? I'm going to spend a little while in prayer before we go back to church tonight. When you walked in here, you could tell a difference. You sure could. You sure could. I'm telling you, it costs time and surrender. You say, what does it cost to fill a place with prayer? Time and surrender. Two, two things. Time and surrender. Time and surrender. When my flesh is pulling this way and I say no I care about them bus kids I care about my grandkids I care about I want them to feel what I felt when I was 18 19 years old when I went to revivals I want them to feel God's power no time and surrender brother and the power of the Lord will fill this room sure will Sure will. I, uh, you've heard me say it before, and some preachers, that people think it's silly, but a lot of preachers do this. I've done it many times. Come in here on Saturday night and walk around. I say, Lord, I pray you bless these seats. I'll touch, touch all these rows down through here. Y all that's silly. I know. I know. That's what, but I say, Lord, touch these people sit on this row. Lord, touch these people sit on this row. Lord, touch these people sit on this row. Lord, touch these And all the way down, you say, Brother Danny, that's silly. There ain't even nobody in here. Yeah, but you know what? It, it ain't long till you start, hey, people start saying, you know what? I went to church Sunday and I could just feel, I, you smell it. You smell it. See, I'm not talking about smelling with your nose. And the odor of that ointment, that the Lord used that as a picture of something you can't see. That's something you can see. 
The bottle of broke perfume. The smell of that spiritually. When people pray, it's like you break a bottle of p- prayer and people smell it spiritually when they walk in them doors. I've had people tell me, they said, when I walked in, I could feel something. I could feel something, Brother Dan. Now, it's not always like that, but it's very costly. You, 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 in, in the singing, you know, you can tell it in singing. Uh, uh, that, that's that song we sung a while ago. That's not a new song. That's not saying, oh boy, this is new. Everybody's going to love it. Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. That's an old song. But God touched it. And just as fresh as it ever was. You understand what I'm saying? Now, you don't build a church on singing. But you ain't going to have much one without good singing. You know, a church ain't built on singing. But it sure ain't going to have much church without some singing. And the singing is not a spiritual American Idol. It's not a, not a contest. It's just singing. Last like Sunday night, I got to singing in here and girls got to singing. If you wasn't here last like Sunday night, oh, I'm telling you what. I, I'm telling you, all of a sudden, right out of, out of the left side of the building over there, whoosh, the Lord came through here. Next thing I know, people's up running around shouting, hollering, uh, screaming, and hollering. Last like Sunday night. You know what that was? That's the odor of the ointment that filled the house of the Lord. Yes, sir. Now, let me show you another one. Second Chronicles 5. Take your Bible now. Turn to the book of Second Chronicles and look at chapter... Uh, let's see here. Number 5, I believe. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 5. Let me show you this principle back in the Old Testament. This very same thing that I'm talking about. They worked, they worked, they built, they brought the musical instruments, they sang, they preached, and look what happened... In verse number 13. First, Second Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 13. Second Chronicles 5, 13. Look at this. It came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one. That's what happened here last Sunday night. To make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praise the Lord saying for he is good his mercy endureth forever look what happened people look what happened that then the house was filled with a cloud even the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God Now, that you say, well, that's an Old Testament. I understand that. But there's a principle there. There's a principle there that when people come and our minds get as one, like happened at camp, like happened at youth rally, and we're all singing to the, and praising the Lord, and everybody gets that one, it, you ain't even going to notice who, 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 who ain't paying attention or who gets up and walks out and whose baby was misbehaved. You ain't even going to notice that then. All of a sudden, something else grabs our attention. All of a sudden, we all get a fresh glimpse of glory. All of a sudden, the praise of God fills the house. Brother, that's what you have when you have real church. We're, we're living in a time when it's all about celebrities and, and, and Christian celebrities. And it's all about the preacher. It ain't all about the preacher. I, I'm, just, I'm just a messenger trying to give you something to help you. That's all I am. I ain't no different, no better than nobody in here. Probably worse than most of you. Uh, if the truth is known. But I'm telling you this morning, when we all get our eyes on him, and we all get our minds off our troubles and off our problem, and it seems like for just a minute, the heavens open up just a little bit, and God gives us a little fresh glimpse and our hope becomes real again. And the Spirit of God stirs down in our soul. Brother, God wants His house filled with power. I'll never forget, never forget. I told you many times. Uh, we had a revival going on up at New Man. We had several over the years. And one of the first ones was, uh, the church wasn't about two years old. And a bunch of kids from high school started getting saved. A bunch of cheerleaders and everything from now high school started getting saved. And they was bringing their friends every service and people getting saved. Now, I know most of y'all wasn't even... Uh, there then, and back back in the early days, I had to do everything. I had to, I played the piano, made the announcements, took up the offering, preached, and gave the invitation. And I, at first, at first, then little by little, the Lord starts in us help. Somebody can do this. Somebody can do that. Somebody can do this. Somebody can do that. And uh, one night, the choir was singing, 
And I was over here just banging around trying, I like, like picturing Jesus something. I was trying to find the key in it and play, play over here. And they brought a girl in there from the high school. I had no idea who it was. But I just remember there's a bunch of them came in. Like a lot of our girls that's got on fire for the Lord since camp. A lot of our bus girls. Uh, I don't mean that bad, but you know, come on the bus. And they all sitting right in here. They sitting right in this section. Well, this girl sat right there. I didn't know her from nobody. But I, I just happened to look and the choir started singing. It started getting good. And I just happened to look over there, and she just started bawling. She hadn't heard a word I said. Didn't know me from Adam. Didn't know her. I am guess she probably didn't even know I was a preacher. And the choir was up singing, and that girl just started bawling. Now, what does that? What does that? I mean, that, that don't, that's not, I mean, that just don't happen in places where the power of God is not in. And I was up here trying to say, some. You know, trying to get somebody's attention. Go, y'all look around. You might see where God can use you. You know, uh, and uh, and I was trying to say, go on, get her. And finally, somebody went and got her and took her to the altar, and she got saved. Her life changed immediately. And I think she was a cheerleader at McDowell High School. And God got a hold of that girl and changed her, as He did a bunch of them back then. Now I know people say, no, you cannot get saved until you hear preaching. That she had heard preaching her whole life at one time or another. It don't say you have to get saved 10 minutes after you hear a preacher preach. It might be years down the road. She knew there was a God. She knew that the Bible was true. And the Lord saved her that night. And you know what that was? The place was filled with power. I've had people tell me this. They say, Brother Danny, it's all emotional. You know, people write in, make comments about me, and they'll say, uh, you're really a good preacher. Why do you have to scream? And I don't even answer them. If they're that dumb, I don't even answer them. Uh, they, first, they don't know the definition of preach. Second, they don't know the definition of believing what you preach and being excited about it. I would say this. Why do you have to scream at a ball game? You know, <laughs> you know why? You're excited about it. Amen? I mean, if you're you on the price, is right, brother. I don't even know if that still comes on, does it? That finally, they finally put that in the old archives. I have no idea. It don't come on no more. I'm not going to price this right. They get up there, you know, and old Bob Barker, he's, he's 79 when I was 10. And uh, he had to be 120 when, when he finally quit the show. And they go on there and he'd say, uh, uh, somebody call him, um, uh, I guess that's the one he's on, wasn't it? Something like that. Oh, Mary Jane, come on down. And buddy, I'm telling you, Mary Jane would be about halfway back here somewhere. She'd have on Mickey Mouse here. She's been to Disneyland since she's out there in California. And here's exactly what she would do. She'd come and go, ah! H -h Hug her friend here. Ah! 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 Grab old Bob. Keep him out there like that. I'm telling you, brother, I see him do that a million times. She ain't won nothing. They ain't give her a blessed thing yet. Chill out, girl. You know what? You know what? She's happy. She's excited. You know what people do when they're happy? They throw their hands up. They jump up and down. They clap. They holler. That's what you do when you're happy. People say that all the time. Oh, I really enjoyed the message, but leave off the screaming. But you, know, you go to a quiet ball game and see how exciting it is. Go to a quiet car race and all the fans sitting there watching the car racing. Lord, you can go to sleep. They're hollering. They're screaming. They're excited about it. And they should be. They should be. Listen, my grandson hits a home run, brother. I'm going to shout too. Amen. Ain't nothing wrong with that. The house was filled. I've heard people say, well, somebody stands up and they shout. And other people see it. So they stand up and shout. And uh, you're showing your immaturity. You're also showing you're a nosy person. Instead of worshiping God, you should be, uh, like you should be, you're looking to see what everybody else is doing. If you get your eyes off everybody else, Lord might bless you. And also, you're showing that you don't understand. You know what I've seen? I've seen a thousand people sitting this way. And two people jump up at the same time, can't even see each other. And start shouting and hit the altar. Did they do it because they did it? No. They didn't even know it. I was going to hit all over the church just like that. I'm telling you, there's something different 
When the power of God comes in. So people think, oh, you preachers, you get everybody all emotionally worked up. Now look, your emotions are definitely involved. I'm, I'm, I'm emotional. And I'm not ashamed of that. I'm glad I am. I don't want to be a deadhead. I'm glad I'm emotional. I'm glad I'm, I'm an extrovert or whatever you want to call it. Thank the Lord. Amen. I'm glad, I'm glad it, I bust if it didn't get out of me somehow or another. I mean, I blow up. Uh, I've, I've seen people go like, Go ahead and let it out, honey. It ain't going to kill you. Get a blessing. Throw your hand up. Say, "Woo! it's good to be saved. Thank the Lord. Fill the place with power. Fill the place with power. That night I went to Nebo Baptist Church and I got saved. I'd been there several times before. I used to have a good friend that went there. And I'd spend the night with him and we'd go. I felt absolutely nothing. We'd sit back there and cut up the whole service. But that night, something different. Preacher, I didn't even hear him preach. That night, when I went and sat down, there's a group from Appalachian State University. Got them started singing. I didn't even know who they was. I went to school with one girl, and she brought them down there sing. Something started moving in that church. Next thing I know, here went one, there went one, here went one, there went one. Next thing I know, I was on the floor crying. That's, that's power. The place was filled with power. They said, oh, Brother Danny, that's just your emotion. Emotion lasted 50 years. Huh? You know when emotions wear out? Next day. If you just get an emotional stir, you'll be the same way in another, in another day or so. But it, it's, uh, there's something there that night, brother, that permanently put something inside of me that ain't never left since. Amen. Thank God. I've failed the Lord a billion times and I've hit the ditches and knocked out mailboxes and everything, but there's always been something down inside since that night when I got a little taste of another world, brother, and something got a hold of me. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight and I got my eyes and I saw a little glimpse of glory and I've never been satisfied with the things of this old world sin. God wants His house filled with praise and power. Thirdly, and I'm through, turn to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, and I'm done. Let me show you this right quick. Now, the truth is, God does want His house filled with people. He sure does. It is the Lord's will that every Bible-believing church be filled. Look here, Mark 2 and verse 1. And again, He entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noised... That he was in the house. They didn't have no internet, no Facebook, no Instagram. The only way they could tell people was just go out. It was noise. People talked about it everywhere. And straightway, many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. They couldn't even get in. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. That place was so full of people that you couldn't get another person in the door. I've been in them like that. I've been in revivals in little churches. We used to take the choir, and Carrie, remember, when she was younger, and we would pull up with about 75 or 80, and the little church would already be packed because revival was going good. And I'd march them in the side door, and they'd come in here like this and sing, and then march them back out and say, y'all go to McDonald's, I'll see you in a while. There was no room. For people to even get in the door. I preached youth rally before where I had, there was people all around in the floor, around here, sit, little kids. Sit. I mean, I had a little circle to preach in about this big. And I'd sit here and I'd hear a little kid go, ah! Or stomped on their foot or something, or their hand. And you couldn't have, there's no room. There's no room. I've been in services at camp where I'd sit like this, and the power of God was moving, people getting saved and getting right with God. And I, I didn't even want to stand up around. That priest could not minister. That's what that other verse said. I was scared to even get up there. Afraid I'd mess it up. That's what I'm talking about. That's what real church is. That's what real church is. Full of people. Full of people. Gypsy Smith, the great evangelist for years in this country, he, he, he won a young boy to the Lord and, and he got this boy saved and he started coming to his meetings and he told, he told Gypsy Smith, he said, Oh, I see it. He said, you give yourself to Jesus, then you leave yourself and go get somebody else. And the preacher said, that's right. 
That's the Christian life. He said, I give myself to Jesus, then I leave myself there at the altar, and I go get somebody else. The next night, he brought his mom, she got saved. The next night, he brought his grandpa, and grandpa got saved. Now, I'm telling you, one of the most exciting times of your life is when you first get right with God. And it's all fresh and all new and all wonderful to you. Then all, the first thing you want to do is go get your sister, your mom, your grandma. Your Bible says, come to church with me. Come to church with me. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That's the way it's supposed to be. Lord, you remember when you used to do that? Remember when you used to couldn't wait to go to church? You'd call your sister and say, why don't y'all come to church, Sonny? Please come to church. Remember that in good old days? That's what the Lord wants. The Lord wants His house to be filled with people. I've heard preachers say, and I've finagled around with myself a little bit about a long, long time ago, and I realized it wasn't right. I've heard preachers get up and say, well, there ain't many of us here tonight, but I believe it's exactly who God wanted. I mean, that sounds pious and everything, but you really believe it? You really believe God didn't want nobody else there? <laughs> That's a weird way to think, you know. I, I mean, I'd, I'd hate to meet somebody downtown and say, Man, we had the best service ever was last night. And they said, good night. I wish I'd have been. Nope, nope. God didn't want you there. <laughs> you see how dumb that was? <laughs> That's crazy. Preachers say all kind of crazy stuff sometimes. I have no idea in the world what they're talking about. You honestly believe. Now, I'll give, it, I'll give you this. Jesus did take Peter, James, and John upon the mountain. There was a certain time when he wanted to do something. I got that. But on a regular Sunday, when, it's, when you're just praying and preaching and worshiping the Lord, you honestly try and tell me that everybody's in church this morning that God wants to be in church? No. No. There's enough people in this county, close to 100,000, unless the population would have between 90 and 100,000 people in Burke County. That means you could have 10 churches with 1,000 people in them. And they ain't marrying that I know of. Maybe one pushes it close to that once in a while down here. Not home down there or wherever that place is. Maybe, maybe. But not, not listen y'all. God wants people to come to church. God wants people to come to church. Yes sir. Ladies and gentlemen, he wants his house filled. Make it a goal. Make it a goal to bring somebody. Make it a goal. Knock on a door. Hand out some tracts. Be a witness. Invite. 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 Use your social media. Invite church. Hey, see you at church Sunday. Come on to church Sunday. Looking for you at church Sunday. Meet me in church Sunday. Amen. Be a, amen. It, it, there's, there's buildings all over this town and all over, all over America with empty pews in it this morning. That ain't, that ain't God's will. That ain't God's will. There's another great preacher in this preacher in this country named East Shire English. And uh, he met a man in a motel one day and started talking to him. And he said, man, you need to get saved. And this man was very arrogant, a very smart mouth. And he said, my brother's read all them religious books. He's got all the religion we need in this family. And other people think, one person in my family is real really fanatical, so that's enough for our whole family. That's what he said. He said, my brother's got enough religion for this family. And the guy said, okay. In nine days, he read that man's name in the obituary column. He's gone. You know what? It was the Lord's will. It was the Lord's will for that guy to go to church and get saved. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all. One day I was out visiting over here down on Salem Road, going out there. And I, I go out there once in a while, this certain little community where a bunch of people all there all kin to each other. And I was knocking on this door. And the guy that lives next door, he was over there and had these hedge bushes through there. And he peeked his head through the bushes. I see you, Danny. I'll be there tomorrow. I said, that's the easiest visit I ever made in my life. I didn't have to say, hey. That's right. I said, man, we want you in church, dude. God wants his house filled. You know what God wants? He wants his house filled with prayer. He wants his house filled with power. And he wants his house filled with people. When he said that my house may be filled, he wasn't just talking about people. If all you've got is a room full of people, that's all you've got, a room full of people. If you don't have power and prayer. Maybe there's somebody here this morning. So you know what, preacher? I need to get in there. Y'all come get a song, girl. Maybe there's somebody here this morning and say, preacher... You know what? I want my kids to see what y'all... Listen, what our kids saw at camp this summer, you can't put a price on that. 
It's very costly. There's no amount of money you can put on the way these lives have been changed. And I'll tell you something else, they'll never forget it. They'll never forget it. I wonder if there'd be somebody here this morning and say, Preacher, we're really, I'm willing to pay a price. I'll pray some this evening. I'll pray for our church. I'll pray for you. I need it worse than anybody in here. Let's all stand and bow our heads for prayer. You say, Brother Danny, I want to do my part. I want to do my part that the house may be filled. God, help us this morning. I pray that you bless every single person here today. God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. It's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. I pray now that you take these few simple truths and use them for the glory of God. Whatever you do, we'll thank you for it. Let our church be filled with power, with praise, with power, and people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. They're singing. They're singing. Amen. Say, Brother Danny, I want to see God's power move in this church. I want to see God's presence in this church. I want to see the power and the praise in our church. Come on. Come on. Let's pray. Amen. Amen. You gotta just keep praying. You got a family member that needs help. Just keep praying. Got somebody not saved in your family? Keep praying. Don't give up. Don't give up. Just keep praying. Keep praying. minutes this morning while these are still praying today. Don't get no hurry. Don't get no hurry. You get it settled. You get it settled between you and God. Get it settled between you and God. Amen. So I'm still praying. Amen. Just keep praying. Just keep praying. The secret to the Christian life is just like boxing or football or anything else. You get knocked down, you get back up. You get knocked down, you get back up. The secret of Christian life is not quit. You don't quit. That's the secret right there. The devil's going to knock you in the head once in a while. Just wipe your nose and keep going. Keep going. Keep going to church. Keep your family. Church. All you people has got all these little kids. I know you. sometimes you think, my goodness, there ain't no use me coming to church. You feel like that for a while, but it'll smooth out. It gets, it gets better. They'll get... They'll grow out of it real quick. Amen. All right. Heart's clear. Amen. All right. Uh, thank you for coming this morning. Uh